This video is brought to you by This video is brought to you by your ever-enduring desire for fucking lasting happiness and your ever-persistent confusion that you just can't seem to fucking get it. Your mental illness. This video is brought to you by my mental illness. This video is brought to you by the orb. I do find some peace with like doing yoga, practicing the piano, folding my laundry, doing all of these like routine things that I need to do to just continue being like a healthy, clean person, you know? Between dieting and exercising more and getting outside more and all these things, I started doing this about four years ago. And I wonder, like thinking back on where I was four years ago, where I am now, Am I any happier now than I was four years ago before I started this like health and wellness journey? And when you first start making progress on things, you see your body make these like physical transformations. I was happier, but now, after we've reached this conclusion that I just seem to not be any happier than I was when I first started this health and wellness journey four years ago, I had to look up to see if there was any science about any of this. I discovered that there is science. Turns out there's a name for what I'm talking about here and it's called the hedonic treadmill. <laughs> hedonic adaptation though is what we're gonna refer to it as because I fucking hate treadmills. The hedonic adaptation thing that I'm talking about is basically this happiness equilibrium. If my brain and body were in a state of total bliss and happiness because I found the routine that's perfect for me, I get up from the same time every day and I do my workout and eat my perfect breakfast and become a fluent pianist and become a real uh, world well-loved socialite. If all of this led me to being 100% satisfied and accomplished and never wanting for anything ever again, then that would be problematic. What's this? never wanting for anything ever again. We can't have that. You need to set your eyes on another prize and go for it, baby. So according to a paper by Mark Buchamp and Benjamin Sylvester studied at University of British Columbia. So you see guys, University of the British Columbia, it's in Canada. I'm just gonna read directly from what they said in the paper. Hedonic adaptation refers to the notion that after positive or negative events, i.e. something good or bad happening to someone, and a subsequent increase in positive or negative feelings, people return to a relatively stable baseline level of affect. For example, events such as reaching an athletic goal or attending a meeting of a weight loss support group may elicit feelings such as joy and hopefulness, respectively. However, the thrill of an athletic achievement and initial hopefulness tend to abate over time. In a classic study that illustrates this hedonic adaptation, Brickman, Coates, and Janoff Bullman in 1978 found that 18 months after winning the lottery, people were no happier than a comparison condition who did not win the lottery. This all sounds very tiring, right? Come on, I don't wanna just be on a treadmill for my entire life. Just maintaining what I have accomplished. But it's not as if there aren't alternatives. Hmm. Have you ever tried drugs? Initially, I think when I first started to try drugs, I was just like experimenting, you know? Mm. Weed, cigarettes, alcohol. That was just the beginning. Have you ever... Have you ever drank a bottle of cough syrup? I don't recommend it. It sucks. Swallowing 15 pills in a row is definitely a lot easier to down than, than drinking cough syrup. But they'll both like kill you or just be really bad for you. So I just don't really recommend either one. But when you're like high, drunk, inebriated, in good spirits, just when you do that every day, having goals and like sticking to them and doing that type of thing is just like why like it just seems like a silly thing to do i found out about this word recently that you call someone a sweat in my like urbandictionary.com research and this like apparently like originated in gaming culture it's someone who tries 
way too hard in like a casual situation to be like the best in the room. Something that's supposed to be like pretty casual and normal and they're taking it way too fucking seriously and they're pulling off these stunts that are just like so insane that they're clearly like sweating to pull it off. Or like a workaholic who wants to like outperform their co-workers who are just putting in like a normal amount of effort and like yeah the workaholic who just like does way too much to like please the boss or whatever. Okay you fucking sweat. Chill out. Anyway I just thought this was funny. When you're doing drugs, there's this kind of like detachment from material accomplishments that feels really freeing when you do it. Um, this is like especially profound when doing like psychedelics and like you're collapsed on the floor and you're laughing and there's like tears running down your face and something like about the world just feels so absurd but it's hilarious in this like perfect way. And then like, you know, let's say someone like brings up that like you've got school or work or something, some other obligation to do like the next day or something and you just hear this and you're like... <laughs> Okay, like, who cares? Like, who fucking cares? It's this kind of, like, larger Earth sense or, like, grandness of the universe sense, Mother Nature sense that, like, you know, a hurricane can happen, the wind can blow so strong, your car could be crushed by a tree, and the inevitability of disaster striking people every single day on this planet is just so inescapable. <sighs> so, where were we? Let's examine the hedonic part of hedonic adaptation. Hedonic hedonism. What's that all about? We know hedonism is the study or philosophy of pleasure and the impact of it on our lives. It's like the philosophy around what pleasure is and brings to our lives and its worthiness. So we have like these branches of hedonism that all stem from the same core, but they have many different attitudes towards life, prescriptive, descriptive. And the first one I wanna talk about is the psychological hedonism. They're all just theories with varying degrees of weight behind them, but the one that I'll start off with is psychological hedonism slash motivational hedonism, and this is basically the theory that from an evolutionary perspective, we are hardwired to pursue pleasure and to avoid pain, and hardwired meaning the things that helped us survive eventually became pleasurable to make us more likely to seek them out. Like delicious honey has a lot of glucose in it, which is awesome for our brains. Honey is delicious and therefore pleasurable. Same thing for sex. Sex feels great, makes us reproduce, and mm, staying warm around a campfire when it's negative 80 degrees as it often gets in New York in January. You wanna get right up to the furnace. But like, it doesn't, it, it's not, it can't be a singular explanation for why we are motivated to do things that we are motivated to do. She's a skeptic. Like for instance, it is not pleasurable to teach a seven-year-old how to read. <laughs> it can be extremely frustrating for both parties involved trying to learn how to read for the first time, especially if you're dyslexic or have a learning disability. It is not easy to learn how to do these things, and it's also not easy or pleasurable or fun to be the adult doing it. I mean, sure, there are ways to make it pleasurable, but I feel like more often than not, it is. It is not fun. The psychological hedonist might say, okay, well, sure, the immediate outcome is that it does not feel pleasurable, but in the long run, the pride that both people involved experience once you've successfully taught the child how to read, the pride is the payoff. But yeah, pride and relief, those are not guaranteed, but it could still be a success and the act of teaching someone how to read would still be worth it in the end, whether or not any pleasure was gained out of the relief from having attained it. It's hoisting itself up as like this psychological um, proposal for why we do what we do, but there hasn't been any like tangible like studies or research. Not, not that there hasn't been any, there has, but it's just so far, it doesn't have like the pillars and weight to hold itself up to scrutiny. Touche, my old friend. 
Then I raise you. Ethical hedonism. So ethical hedonism is kind of a wild child, fun little sibling of consequentialism, which consequentialism, if you'll remember from The Good Place, is the form of ethics that's concerned with how good or bad an action's outcome is on those that it affects. So if it results in like a million deaths, then it's probably not very ethical, but if it results in saving a million lives, then that's a good thing, right? But we get a little more specific with uh, ethical hedonism. Instead of something being good or bad, which is very vague, how the fuck do you judge that? Hmm. But instead of good or bad, it's pleasure versus pain. How pleasurable and how many people that pleasure affects and the duration intensity of that pleasure and the same thing vice versa for the pain that it could potentially cause. Uh, I kind of like it. That's not my favorite, but I think there are instances where it holds up. Let's say you have an example of a 20 person orgy and over 50 orgasms are the result of this 20 person orgy. But let's also say that in the orgy, someone gets murdered and it was intentional. A murder, by the way, is a non-consensual death. A painless murder by poison, let's say. I literally thought this up. Why did I think this up? What was I thinking? So if you die by poison, it's painless. It's quick. You're not even aware that it's happening. That caused you no pain whatsoever. It might have you might have even been coming while it happened. So, in an ethical hedonism model, you might find that a murder by poison that was painless in an orgy setting, the pleasure derived was far more significant than the relative lack of pain that happened. So, boom, we got an ethical murder right here. Welcome to the internet. Have a look around. Anything that brain of yours can think of can be found. Okay, stop it. Listen, I raise you the last of the hedonisms. Please stop, please stop, please stop. <gasps> axiological hedonism, which is creating a value system around pleasure and pain. Come on, you knew it was heading there. It's essentially saying that the only thing that is actually of any inherent value is pleasure. There's this dude, his name is Jerry Bentham. He lived in London, England in like the years 1748 to 1832, 32, in London, England. And um, he thought about this pleasure and pain stuff a lot. He was a hedonist. He, he didn't call himself an axiological hedonist. He called himself like a fucking Protestant hedonist. I don't remember. I don't remember what he called himself. It doesn't fucking matter. And for our intents and purposes, we're going to call him an axiological hedonist. He literally came up with this idea of a hedonic calculus system seriously so he believed that pleasure is the only thing with intrinsic value so intrinsic as opposed to instrumental value means it is valuable in and of its own existence whereas instrumental value for instance is like a microwave or a hammer it doesn't it's not intrinsically valuable but it's instrumentally valuable in that you use it to do something that brings about a valuable outcome. So how did they come upon this? I don't know. I think this guy, Jeremy Bentham, he was an atheist, so he kind of, he didn't really believe in the Bible. <laughs> Fucking heathens. No, but um, he wanted to have like a more tangible framework for how to judge actions in their positive and negative values and, and just claiming it's something is a good thing or a bad thing. It doesn't really have you got to get more specific than that is pain and pleasure like these are things that we all kind of inherently understand every that's part of the human condition we all understand pain and pleasure jeremy bentham's hedonic calculus he had a few different parameters certainty propin 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 propinquity propinquity propin, certainty propinquity 
fecund I gotta look this one up. I don't even know how to say this. One. Fecundity. Ready for it? Fecundity. Fecundity. Purity. Extent. Intensity and duration. Let's define them. Certainty refers to the likelihood that the pleasure or pain will occur. Propinquity refers to how long away, in terms of time, the pleasure or pain is. Fecundity refers to the likelihood of the pleasure or pain leading to more of the same sensation. Purity refers to the likelihood of the pleasure or pain leading to some of the opposite sensation. Extent refers to the number of people the pleasure or pain is likely to affect. Intensity refers to the felt strength of the pleasure or pain. Duration refers to how long the pleasure or pain are felt for. An axiological hedonist might say that my murder slash orgy example of a murder doesn't really stand up. For instance, the pain and suffering that a victim's loved ones would experience as a consequence of the victim's death. If the pain outweighs the pleasure that was derived from it, the pain wins and the, the act of the poison, painless murder, is unethical. But I raise you, what if the victim of the murder was not well loved? What if nobody loved him? What if he was actually really disliked and actually nobody experiences any unhappiness or displeasure or suffering as a consequence of his death? Then we're back to the murder being ethical. But what if one of the people who was part of the murder is haunted by the murder. What if the murder is psychologically taxing to any of the people who were part of the poisoning? What if they can never experience orgasm again without being reminded of this like kind of strange traumatic experience? We are done with that example. Earth shattering, but okay, all right, anyway. We're moving on now. We're not going to talk about it again. And take it away. Picture of Dorian Gray, originally published in 1890 in some fucking magazine. I don't know. It was a much shorter version of the novel that we all know and love today. And it was outrageous. Yeah, people didn't like it because it was very homoerotic and sexy as fuck and just people don't like fun things. One year later, Oscar Wilde republished it in the novel form that we do all know and he made some interesting changes from the original publication. He kind of dialed it down on some of the homoerotic details and turned them into more just like artsy platonic love instead of being so fucking gay. And he also added an entire character, James Vane, which is the brother to Sybil Vane. So if you don't know the original plot of Picture of Dorian Gray, the book, then I'll just summarize it for you here real quick. It's about this guy who is very fine, very good looking. His name is Dorian Gray. He befriends this guy named Basil Hallward. Basil is a very talented painter artist man and Basil kind of falls in love with Dorian, um, sees him as somewhat of his own muse. So Basil paints a picture of Dorian, uh, if you can imagine. While Basil is painting Dorian, his friend, Lord Henry Wotton, is kind of just watching and hanging out while the painting is happening. And he's talking all this wonderful, lovely stuff about pleasure, pain, life, happiness, all these things. And Dorian, who's modeling, is listening and he's intrigued and it kind of strikes this chord with him. And when the painting of the beautiful Dorian is revealed at last, Dorian looks at the youth and beauty and wishes to never grow old and ugly. Because um, originally, Dorian never thought about this stuff. He never thought about his own good looks or anything. Not really. But suddenly, uh, listening to Lord Henry talk about, you know, how beauty is just like the ultimate good virtue. And Dorian's like, whoa, I never had the words for it. I never thought about it like this before. But now that you're saying all these things, I think that I've always believed it. Dude, this is amazing. And basically, Dorian's just a very easily influenced little boy. He's just, he, he doesn't know what he believes, okay? He's not a principled young man. He sees the painting and he's like, oh my god, how unfair is it that I have to age and grow old while this painting gets to stay in this state of perfect beauty? I hate this. He kind of says, I would trade my soul. I would trade my soul for it to, to just stay young and beautiful for my entire life. And I wish that the painting would age and that I would stay young. And everybody's like, oh, come on, Dorian, don't be melodramatic. And somehow his wish comes true. 
we know this because fast forward a little bit Doreen is dating this girl named Sybil Vane she's an actress in a bunch of Shakespearean plays in a cute little small town theater and Dorian falls in love with Sybil for her ability to act because Dorian's new philosophy about taking pleasure in beautiful art and Sybil is an artist so it fits. One day Dorian goes to see Sybil in a play and he brings his two friends along Basil and uh, Lord Henry for the first time and he's like been bragging about Sybil. He's been like oh my god you guys will never believe that Sybil is fucking amazing and his friends are like skeptical. They're like dude you fell in love with like this lowly like actress and now you think you're gonna marry her and uh, Dorian you're so melodramatic come on but he's like no no you have to see it you have to see it you'll believe it when you see it. She has a hard time pretending to be in love with someone on the stage now that she's experienced true love in her own life it's actually kind of sad and sweet and poetic yet she completely fucking botches the play like, like kind of reciting the lines it says but like she doesn't deliver any of the same like emotion that she has in previous ones she's like kind of lost her touch so after the play dorian is just like pissed and is just embarrassed and disappointed and all these things he goes backstage to talk to sybil and basically is just like sybil what the fuck was that and sybil is like dorian you don't understand i realize that now i see the true beauty of life and, and having loved you and before i had no experience and i thought that i could play and act it out and, and 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 pretend that i knew what love is but now that i know what love is it's so shallow to be up on that stage it just doesn't make any sense to me i can't i can't deliver the same performance that i did before because now i know that that stuff is empty and hollow dorian i love you and dorian's just like it, you're ridiculous you're ridiculous. I loved you because you were an artist. You were amazing. You did things that I'd never seen anybody do before. And now you're, you're just, you're just like anybody else. You suck. It's really sad. He rejects her. He says that he never wants to see her again. But when he gets home and he sees the painting that Basil has done of him and he gets home and he sees it and it has like this kind of ugly sneer on it that wasn't there before. And Dorian sees it and he's like, mm -hmm. He you know, like has to look double take and he thinks that he's imagining it, but no, it's there. The painting is altered. It's different than it was. And um, you know, like speculates like, oh, did somebody change it? But he's like, no, no, it doesn't look like it. That paint is the same paint that was there all along, but the expression and the lines around the face, that painting is altered. And he realizes that that wish that he made, you know, kind of offhanded, but it was genuine. It was a wish to trade his soul. His wish came true. Okay, here's the thing. In the 1891 publication of the book after the magazine had already, you know, come out like a year earlier, Oscar Wilde includes a preface that he had not included in the original uh, transcript or whatever, I guess, of the story. So I want to read it for you here now. So it goes, I'm just going to do a couple of excerpts. I'm not like reading the entire thing, but it goes... The artist is the creator of beautiful things. To reveal art and conceal the artist is art's aim. The critic is he who can translate into another manner or a new material his impression of beautiful things. The highest as the lowest form of criticism is a mode of autobiography. Those who find ugly meanings in beautiful things are corrupt without being charming. This is a fault. Those who find beautiful meanings in beautiful things are the cultivated. For these there is hope. They are the elect to whom beautiful things mean only beauty. There is no such thing as a moral or an immoral book. Books are well written or badly written. That is all. No artist desires to prove anything. Even things that are true can be proved. No artist has ethical sympathies. An ethical sympathy in an artist is an unpardonable mannerism of style. No artist is ever morbid. The artist can express everything. Thought and language are to the artist instruments of an art. Vice and virtue are to the artist materials for an art. All art is at once surface and symbol. Those who go beneath the surface do so at their peril. Those who read the symbol do so at their peril. It is the spectator and not life that art really mirrors. Diversity of opinion about a work of art shows that the work itself is new, complex, and vital. When critics disagree, the artist is in accord with himself. We can forgive a man for making a useful thing as long as he does not admire it. The only excuse for making a useless thing is that one admires it intensely. All art is quite useless. To me, this preface reads as someone who's kind of just like, ah, da, 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 da. Uh, uh, okay, no. Read the sign. Did you read the fucking sign? Read the sign. I don't want to hear it. He's kind of like addressing the criticism before it comes his way again. He's just like, I'm tired of it. 
I don't fucking care. I don't fucking care what you have to say. And it kind of reminds me of Bo Burnham's um, Don't Wanna Know song from Inside. It's just this like kind of proclamation that like, I know I created something. I know, I know that you have opinions on it, but I don't care. I don't want to hear it. Anything you have to say, any commentary, questions, comments, anything, I don't want to hear it. It's all right there. I did everything that I want to do. It's all right there. Please do not come to me with any of your shit. I do not give a fuck. Art is meaningless. It is. It doesn't have morality. It doesn't reflect anything. It just is what it is. Just let me write. Just let me be a creator, an artist. That's all I am in the end. Fuck! So Sybil Vane, dead, leaves behind her mother and her brother who had become a sailor and he was going to Australia. James Vane, torn apart by her death. And James, of course, didn't trust this Prince Charming character that Sybil so fondly referred to Dorian as. James doesn't even know what Dorian's name is. He only knows Dorian as Prince Charming. But he swears that he's gonna fucking find this Prince Charming prick and fucking beat the fucking shit out of his fucking face until he's dead with a fucking revolver. He's just gonna shoot him, probably in an alley somewhere. 18 years have passed, uh, and Dorian Gray goes to an opium den to... <sighs> Who knows? Who knows what Dorian's up to at this point in his life? Well, he went to the opium den, obviously, because to cure the soul by means of the senses, and the senses by means of the soul. That's what Lord Henry told them. So Dorian's just fucking doing what his best friend told him to. Lord Henry was like, yeah, yes, that was the secret. He had often tried it, and he would do it again now. Dorian fucking killed Basil. Jesus Christ. So yeah, that's why he needs to go to the opium den. He killed he fucking murdered somebody that he loved, and yeah, so now he needs to go to the fucking opium den to uh, flush that feeling out. Yeah, so he's he's going to leave, and he's saying goodbye to one of his friends. And mind you, he said the most fucking hilariously terrible thing to this woman, who <laughs> she goes, the lady says to him, We are very proud tonight, she sneered. For God's sake, don't talk to me, cried Dorian, stamping his foot on the ground. What do you want? Money? Here it is. Don't ever talk to me again. <laughs> Dorian says goodnight to his friend Adrian. And then Dorian walked to the door with a look of pain on his face. And as he drew the curtain aside, a hideous laugh broke from the painted lips of the woman who had taken his money. There goes the devil's bargain, she hiccuped in a hoarse voice. Curse you, he answered. Don't call me that. She snapped her fingers. Prince Charming! Is that what you like to be called, ain't it? A drowsy sailor leaped up to his feet as she spoke and looked wildly around. Shutting up the hall door fell on his ear. He rushed out as if in pursuit. Dorian gets called his old nickname, Prince Charming. It's kind of like at this point, it seems like all the like kind of random townsfolk who have just been watching Dorian not age for these last 18 years while everybody around him just gets older and he's just fucking terrible. Like the people know that he... They call him Devil's Bargain. She said it. She called him. There goes the Devil's Bargain. And he goes, don't call me that. And, uh, fucking great book. So James actually follows Dorian out of the bar and uh, down into an alleyway. Dorian Gray hastened on, quickening his step as he went. But as he darted aside into a dim archway that had served him often as a shortcut to the ill-famed place where he was going, he felt himself suddenly seized from behind. And before he had time to defend himself, he was thrust back against the wall with a brutal hand around his throat. He struggled madly for life and by terrible effort wrenched the tightening fingers away. In a second, he heard the click of a revolver and saw the gleam of a polished barrel pointing straight at his head and the dusky form of a short, thick-set man facing him. What do you want? <laughs> what do you want? He gasped. Keep quiet, said the man. If you stir, I'll shoot you. You are mad. What have I done to you? You wrecked the life of Sybil Vane, was the answer. And Sybil Vane was my sister. She killed herself. I know it. Her death is at your door. I swear I would kill you in return. For years I have sought you. I had no clue, no trace. The two people who could have described you were dead. I knew nothing of you but the pet name she used to call you. I heard it tonight by chance. Make your peace with God, for tonight you are going to die. Dorian grew sick with fear. I never knew her, he stammered. I never heard of her. You are mad. 
You had better confess your sin, for as sure as I am James Vane, you are going to die. It was a horrible moment. Dorian did not know what to say or do. Down on your knees, growled the man. I'll give you one minute to make your peace. No more. I go on board tonight for India, and I must do my job first. One minute, that's all. Dorian's arms fell to the side, paralyzed with terror. He did not know what to do. Suddenly, a wild hope flashed across his brain. Stop, he cried. How long ago is it since your sister died? Quick, tell me. Eighteen years, said the man. Why do you ask me? What do years matter? Eighteen years, laughed Dorian with a touch of triumph in his voice. Eighteen years? Set me under the lamp and look at my face. James Fane hesitated for a moment, not understanding what was meant. Then he seized Dorian Gray and dragged him from the archway. Dim and wavering as was the wind-blown night, yet it served to show him the hideous error, as it seemed, into which he had fallen for the face of the man he had sought to kill, had all the bloom of boyhood, all the unstained purity of youth. He seemed little more than a lad of twenty summers, hardly older, if older indeed at all, than his sister had been when they had parted so many years ago. It was obvious that this was not the man who had destroyed her life. He loosened his hold and reeled back. My God, my God, he cried, and I would have murdered you. Dorian drew a long breath. You have been on the brink of committing a terrible crime, my man, he said, looking at him sternly. Let this be a warning to you not to take vengeance into your own hands. Dorian's such a fucking bitch. It's sad because uh, Oscar Wilde said that thing about, he like wrote in a letter to a friend that picture of Dorian Gray is an autobiography of sorts that he thinks that the public sees Oscar Wilde as Lord Henry Wotton, but Oscar Wilde sees himself as Basil, but he wishes to be Dorian Gray. James Vane stood on the pavement in horror. He was trembling from head to foot. After a little while, a black shadow that had been creeping along the dripping wall moved out into the light and came close to him with stealthy footsteps. He felt a hand laid on his arm and looked around with a start. It was one of the women who had been drinking at the bar. Why didn't you kill him? She hissed out putting her haggard face quite close to his. I knew you were following him when he rushed out from Daly's. You fool, you should have killed him. He has lots of money and he's bad as bad. He's not the man I'm looking for, he answered. And I want no man's money. I want a man's life. The man whose life I want must be nearly 40 now. This one is little more than a boy. Thank God I have not got his blood upon my hands. The woman gave a bitter laugh. Little more than a boy, she sneered. Why, man, it's nigh on 18 years since Prince Charming made me what I am. You lie, cried James Vane. She raised her hand up to heaven. Before God, I am telling the truth, she cried. Before God, strike me dumb if it ain't so. He is the worst one that comes here. They say he has sold himself to the devil for a pretty face. It's nigh on 18 years since I met him. He hasn't changed much since then. I have, though, she added with a sickly leer. You swear this? I swear it. But don't give me away to him, she whined. I'm afraid of him. Let me have some money for my night's lodging. He broke from her with an oath and rushed to the corner of the street, but Dorian Gray had disappeared. Finally finds this motherfucker and... Oh boy, and he slips from his fucking fingers, that slimy little fucking bitch, fucking Dorian Gray, fucking lying ass bitch. He sold his soul to the fucking devil. Who heard of such a thing? It was the 1800s. People did it all the time. Dorian now is like looking over his shoulder behind every fucking curtain, every fucking corner that he rounds. He's like afraid that he's being hunted because obviously he is but he did get away so how does he um i think like he just see, he, like he straight up sees james vane's face in his own in like his window orion gray is just like going about like oh i got away and like the next day or something like he's in his like living room or whatever and then he literally sees james vane So James makes it his life mission to now stalk and hunt Dorian. Um, and so he does, he tracks him down, but 
only to get killed by a stray bullet from a hunting party uh that he was like he was like hiding in the bushes watching dorian and he gets killed by a fucking stray bullet like total accident he dies again none of that was in the original story so i feel like i used to think that hedonism was this like live fast die young uh sex drugs alcohol rock and roll it's kind of just this fucking cat um endorsement and, and of of all pleasures and just placing, <laughs> placing pleasure above all else pleasurable experiences above above all other experiences for instance you get a pet a little kitty because you love to cuddle her and kiss her and love her you don't get her because you want to get her off the streets you get her because you want love and companionship with your pleasurable experiences and that is the hedonistic perspective on this i guess um she's so cute i love her and she's so fucking annoying though nope she's so annoying i i love her I love her though. I fucking love her. Okay, get out of here. So, but now that I've done all this research, I found out that that hedonism that I thought was commonly referred to as hedonism was actually not hedonism. It's what we call folk hedonism, which awesome. I love folk music. Real philosophers aren't talking about savoring the melting delicacy of a Giardelli chocolate on your tongue. They aren't talking about popping open a bottle of champagne, pouring a little orange juice over it, and kicking back uh, and saying I fucking love brunch. But if it's not any of these things, then I'm just gonna keep going on being a part of the common folk who like chocolate and mimosas and getting fucking laid. Yeah, these philosophical hedonists sound like fucking sweats. aspects of Jeremy Bentham's axiological hedonism. A lot of it makes actually perfect sense to me about wanting to have something a little more substantial to base our value system off of. This cat. This cat cannot stand her. She just does everything that could possibly be the most annoying thing. It's just that all of these hedonisms, I feel like they just take themselves way too seriously uh, and too far, you know, too much. Oh yeah, like this is going to be the, you know, the explanation for all of our behavior or the or defining characteristic of what makes an act moral or immoral. Or it's both trying to be prescriptive and descriptive. I mean, you know, different branches off of the same thing, but I just... It's not enough finer, deeper answers that I think that we're really seeking when we're trying to understand where lasting happiness is derived from, you know? It's nice that I think that Jeremy Bentham was aware of this at least. Like I think that he knew that it was kind of lacking in something, but he just, it's admirable. Like he was going for something here, right? Like he was, he, like I said, he was an atheist. He wanted more of like a, a moral compass to guide people that was based in something that we all kind of understood and something that's tangible to all of us. From that, he deduced starving to death is extremely painful. I feel like Oscar Wilde saw something suspicious in this sort of John Stuart Mill's version of hedonism, and I think that he wanted to maybe examine it a little more closely. Hello. I realized at this point in the video that I never actually said anything about John Stuart Mills until right now and I'm just bringing him up out of nowhere. But John Stuart Mills, to give just like a brief explanation of who this guy was, he was a, a student actually of Jeremy Bentham's and he criticized Jeremy Bentham's version of quantifying how much pleasure and pain different experiences can cause people. He criticized it because he thought that it was too uh, lowly 
by saying that pleasure is the only thing with intrinsic value and something like sex or eating yummy food or <laughs> pleasures of the body, essentially. Um, if we say that these things have intrinsic value and the more pleasure that you get out of something, because obviously orgasms are like one of the like top tier pleasures, you know, and also just like food, drinking alcohol, drug use, things like that. Um, these are like top tier pleasures, feel great. So quantifiably they get like, they're up there, you know? So uh, John Stuart Mills thought that this was promoting a lifestyle of swine. He said that, that this hedonism would eventually just become a philosophy of promoting uh, grimy behavior, in his opinion. He came up with a new sort of thought system around the pleasure and the intrinsic value that comes from it, and he said that we need to divide pleasures into pleasures of quantity and quality low quality pleasures being that of the body, drinking alcohol, sex, drugs, eating, so gluttony, um, but gluttony is great. Anyway, um, and then high quality pleasures, which to him were going to the opera, philosophizing, having an intellectually stimulating conversation. These are the high quality things, reading a book, he wanted to have his cake and eat it too, basically. Uh, in terms of its actual relevance to us in our lives and this idea that like the beauty of the, of the, of the play, like the high quality intellectual pleasures that we can derive from life, is it actually, is there any substance to that? Does that actually mean anything? Or is that just somebody like, like jerking their own like ego to, to make themselves feel like they're better than other people? So now James Vane has died. No one is gonna kill Dorian. But Dorian feels, once again, uh, overwhelmed with guilt and remorse about the way that he's lived his life and the fact that, you know, James Vane has now died in his attempt to avenge Sybil Vane, which, you know, back in the day when it originally happened and Sybil Vane committed suicide, Dorian felt extremely guilty about it. He was yeah, once again, um, overwhelmed with remorse about how he had treated her. And this was before he even realized that she had committed suicide. He writes her this very long, professive, like, love letter in which he's just, you know, accusing himself of madness and, and saying, you know, I, I've done all these terrible things and I'm sorry and, you know, we can still get married. I still love you. Let's please, you know, um, move past this. But I think we're back in business. Angle her downwards. We're looking at me. Hi, thank you very much. Yes, I know this is about me. And James Vane has died and Dorian Gray promises to live a righteous life and graciously does not break the heart of his current romantic interest, Hattie Merton. He goes home to the picture to see if his one good deed has had any effect on the portrait in the attic. He expects it to be better looking. I said, no. Dorian realizes that it's uglier because his intentions weren't to simply be kind and compassionate and thoughtful towards this person. He, see the act of kindness, like for the sake of the act of kindness, he realizes that his intentions were corrupt, a vain decision, hoping to um, reflect more beauty upon the portrait of himself in hopes of like redeeming his soul. Dorian, who, by the way, we didn't even touch on this, but Dorian earlier in the story murdered Basil Halward. After he's committed all these terrible deeds and Basil looks at this portrait and he doesn't even recognize it anymore. But then he sees his own signature in the bottom uh, right or left hand side of the portrait. And he's like, oh my God, this is my original portrait. Dorian, what the fuck have you done? And Dorian takes out a knife and he goes, ah, he stabs, he stabs him. He stabs and kills Basil Halward. But fast forward, Dorian is alone with the picture and he realizes that his soul just, he's irredeemable at this point. He can't be saved. He takes the knife with which he had previously killed Basil Howard, and he stabs the portrait with it repeatedly. He stabs it, he stabs it, he stabs it, he screams, he's agonized, he screams. His servants find him after they break in, after hearing all this ruckus. An old man, actually. Just an old man, deformed, and ugly 
and above him a picture of the young and perfect and flawless Dorian Gray, the portrait restored to its original beauty. The only reason why they can even tell that the old man is in fact Dorian Gray is because of the rings on his fingers. But moving on, in 1978, there was a study done on this idea of hedonic adaptation. They wanted to take lottery ticket winners and see if they were actually made happier by the large sum of money that they had have fall upon their lap. They compared them to uh, people who were recently paralyzed, um, paraplegics and quadriplegics after traumatic accidents. And then they had a control group of average people, just random people that they selected out of, out of a phone book. Um, obviously, happiness can't be measured in meters or fluid ounces, and you can't just do a brain scan on people. So you could really only just do these subjective, self-assessments. So having people basically rate their level of happiness on a scale of zero to five. They asked these participants to rate their happiness on just a slew of random things. And they also asked them to rate their present happiness at this stage in life. So not necessarily at that moment in front of the interviewer, but just the lottery winner scored an average of 3.33 happy points. And the paraplegic and quadriplegic groups scored an average of 3.48 happy points. The paralyzed people were marginally happier than the lottery ticket winners. Marginally. I mean, we're talking 3.33 to 3.48, so it's not that big of a difference. But still, this is counterintuitive to what people would have expected. This study is famous for subverting people's expectations about what to expect out of just getting a whole bunch of fucking money all at once. You'd think people would be made happier by that. And they were directly after the event and within three to six months after the event. But more than a year after the event really didn't seem to make much of a difference. And vice versa, having a traumatic event happen actually didn't make people any like less happy substantially in the long run, which you would also expect to have happen. What they theorized, these psychologists, that having something big happen and life changing, whether positive or negative. It gives people a new baseline to measure all of the other experiences in life off of this one. So if that experience is an extremely positive experience, such as getting a whole bunch of fucking money, initially will come with a momentary boost in happiness. But after a while, hedonic adaptation, you'll adapt to it. And this was another thing that they found that the people who were paralyzed really looked back upon their life before the incident happened uh, in a very romanticized, nostalgic way. They felt like they had it all before. Whereas the people who were the lottery ticket winners um, kind of rated their lives before the lottery winning as rather negative uh, in terms of their happiness. So that was also just interesting. So in many ways, the findings of this study actually makes a lot of sense. You've heard the expression, money can't buy happiness. Most of us can understand how a near-death experience can um, create a newfound vigor in life that a person previously did not have. So a lot of ways, this is kind of intuitive. But I kind of have a little bit of a critique of this study and not necessarily of the study itself, but just of how people tend to take things like this. I feel like people think that, um, that like this type of thing would lead a person to believe, especially if, they con if it's like a confirmation bias for them, that having a life of misfortune or going through something very difficult is good for a person in some way, that it makes them um, build character, be stronger, you know, and this is like clearly harmful. There's obvious reasons why that's not true, why going through something traumatic actually does not build character or make you stronger in any way and vice versa, thinking that like, you know, oh, improving somebody's living conditions uh, by way of having more money, that like, oh, that doesn't actually help them uh, be happier when like there are plenty of instances where that's not true and actually having a raised standard of living is in fact good for a person. <laughs> what do you know? And I want to just make one quick note here. What I am not saying is that a person 
cannot or will not come out stronger after a traumatic experience. It's just, I think we have this pattern of glorified trauma and almost make it sound like it's a rite of passage for a person to become a strong, resilient person. Trauma can break a person. And some people would say, yeah, that's the point. It either makes or breaks a person. And, you know, it's kind of like a, a survival of the fittest type of thing. If, you know, you got the stuff to live through it, then good on you. And if you don't, then that's just too bad. Life is too damn hard for you to handle, I guess. Because here's my problem. You're just trying to justify terrible experiences for people right? that it's actually a good thing. But it's not. It, it leads people to believe that a life of fortune can make people hardened to the sweeter aspects of life um, and be more greedy and unsatisfied with their lives. These things can be true in extreme circumstances and we love looking to extreme examples of things to give us some sort of absolute answer in life. But people aren't all lottery winners or quadriplegics. Money does not buy emotions, but experiences create emotions and daily experiences create a condition for the soul. Blackpool, England is a city in England that is about 55 miles north of Liverpool and it is a place with like either the highest or one of the highest uh, we'll just say one of the highest uh, rates of prescribed uh, antidepressants in England it's also a place that's cursed with economic uh, despair a lot of people have fled there from other places because rent was skyrocketing the cost of living was becoming unaffordable in places like London and Liverpool so they had to leave in search of better rent essentially and um, just a more affordable cost of living essentially these are people who are outcasts by society and, and they still can't afford to live um it's still really difficult and depressing to try to scrape by when you're unable to make a living off of a full-time job maybe multiple jobs trying to take care of a family and you just are scraping by and that's just the minimum on top of possible you know <sighs> abuse and domestic violence in a household. That's a reality that people live with. There are nine other places in the UK with similarly high rates of prescribed antidepressants and economic despair. These two things seem to be highly correlated. Uh, wonder why. Mental health care providers in these areas schedule about 10 minute appointment slots with each patient, which is all they have time for because they are so overwhelmed with the number of people who need mental health aid and the mental health care providers are like openly acknowledging this is not enough time. They openly acknowledge that an antidepressant prescription is completely inadequate to address the needs of the patients who yes are suffering in their mental health but for reasons that Zoloft and Bupropion cannot address. A person stretched thin over multiple jobs, weeks behind on sleep with a diet lacking in vital nutrients is the only thing that their money and time can buy in a location cursed with crime and overlooked by the upper classes who forced them there in the first place. Healthcare providers being the only people from the outside to get a close enough look at these people to see how much more is going on than just chronic anxiety. They call it shit life syndrome. The people in the quadriplegic slash paraplegic group had more support in their recovery. They were very much taken care of and given attention and affection and just the much needed support that you need to recover from such a traumatic accident. Contrast that with the people of Blackpool who are framed in their misfortune as somehow deserving of their life circumstances as if it's some sort of a consequence for bad moral behavior. Uh? Like, what? We often just, we, we frame poor people as being deserving of what's happened to them. And it, of course, becomes internalized in most circumstances, which, of course, feeds into the just situation just being so, so fucked up. <laughs> Contrast that again with the lottery ticket winners who distanced themselves from a lot of their relationships or, or just found that past relationships that they had had just weren't as good after they won all of that money. And they were often suspicious of people who would reach out to them who hadn't 
who were newcomers in their life. They were suspicious of them thinking that they just wanted money out of the deal. And then old friends kind of tended to draw back from them because they didn't want to be perceived as if they were just after money. They didn't also maybe like the relational closeness of like being perceived as someone who's close to someone who won the lottery and being thought of as someone who's getting perks out of that relationship. There's this thing called the paradox of hedonism, which seems to be more concerned with lasting happiness than it is with instant gratification, instant pleasure. Because there's no paradox in like chocolate or masturbation. Like if you want to have an orgasm, you just reach down and make it happen. Like there's no paradox in that. If you seek it out, you will get it. <laughs> okay. The paradox of hedonism or also known as like the pleasure or happiness paradox is that the more that you seek something out, the more that you're not going to get it. And the more you try not to get it, the more you're going to get it. So in one study done in mm, Boston, no, the University of British Columbia, actually, um, but they, the participants were from Boston. And so these people, they worked for like a law firm and they were gonna get like a $5,000 bonus from their job. And un it was like unbeknownst to the people who were gonna get that $5,000 bonus. And uh, so of course the studiers knew about it. And so they interviewed the people before and after receiving the bonus. And they wanted to see basically if how people spent their money was going to correlate with their perceived levels of happiness. Before and after, they asked them about their perceived levels of happiness, and then they asked them how they spent their money after they got the $5,000 bonus. Those who spent the money on other people reported a higher level of happiness relative to those who did not spend their money on other people. A giving heart receives the fruits of their gift. Wisdom. It's fake. Let's get back to Dorian. Dorian spends 20 years almost chasing bliss and pleasure in the picture of Dorian Gray. He might claim he's got it all, but it's clear he's deeply unsatisfied. Wanting for more and more is not enough. He tries a different approach to happiness by reconciling his sins and showing an act of kindness to his lover, Hetty Merton. Uh, his motives, however, are not the act of kindness in and of itself. The portrait reflects his corruption of motive, and Dorian is driven to anguish. The paradox of hedonism. On another note, in the CBS sitcom show, The Good Place, the premise relies on a point system of morality that all of the people operating within it, just everybody is subject to this point system, uh, whether they're privy to it or not. Usually they're not. Actions that are good receive positive point values and actions that are bad receive negative point values. And to the extent to which the positivity and negativity reaches more people more intensely affects the numerical value of those points. It's a lot like consequentialism in that way. Like. Exactly, like consequentials. So Tahani is one of the main four characters in The Good Place who has ended up in the bad place from her actions on Earth. So although a look at Tahani's life on Earth shows her raising money through fundraising parties for those in need and using her wealth and influence to reallocate resources, the point of her being the bad place though is that Tahani was motivated not by desire to help others, but by reputation, pride, and competition with her own sister. She wanted nothing more than approval from her parents and from the rest of the world. And then, similarly, Eleanor has this moment where, so she realizes that she's kind of wrapped up in this case of mistaken identity and that she is mistakenly in the good place, or so she thinks. So she needs to start living and learning positive ethics because as it is the fact that she's kind of an imposter in the good place is kind of causing a lot of like chaotic shit to happen in the good place because like the equilibrium whatever things just aren't in sync because there's an imposter but nobody knows who it is the theory that she and chi come up with is that maybe if she starts doing good things then things will start to equal out in the good place and the things will start to steady so she starts trying to learn ethics with the intention of kind of flying under the radar but this ends up not working out for her and crazy shit continues to happen in the good place and 
it's because they realize, oh, well, <laughs> you weren't really doing good things for the sake of doing good things. You were doing good things because you were trying to selfishly stay in the good place and not confess and come forward and be honest about this whole mistaken identity thing. The good place has a lot to say about these kinds of ethics. So I'd like to try to get back around to the point here. What we're looking for is a picture of what it is to just find lasting, deeply felt happiness. What does a bitch gotta do? We understand there's this thing called the hedonic treadmill, and it seems like no matter what the fuck you do, you're just gonna be on that bitch, no matter how much you level up and promote happiness in your own life. We also know that if you, because of the hedonic paradox, if you seek happiness, you're not really gonna get it. We do know that helping people tends to bring lasting happiness but again it doesn't bring lasting happiness if you're doing it for the selfish reason of making yourself feel good it doesn't work and then having such a good long look at hedonism is showing that yeah pleasure seeking behavior on its own also doesn't work this is so uninspiring what's a girl to do this picture is even more bleak when we consider the lives of the people in cities like Blackpool, where the disaffected population, it, they can't even find any sort of happiness equilibrium. They are just cursed with mental health illness because sometimes the circumstances of our life are just so bleak. Suffering is pretty much the default. There is this often misquoted and mistranslated and misunderstood but it is something that people repeat in the west often enough about buddhism that there's this old adage that goes life is suffering now this isn't a very good i mean yeah this isn't <laughs> this isn't a very good interpretation of what the, the saying actually is it's that life is dukkha d-u-k-k-h-a um i think it's pronounced dukkha i actually should have looked that up before i started filming which we have loosely translated from poly into english as suffering but it could also just be um translated as discontent or dissatisfaction now, there's not really one english word that can be like one-to-one -one translated for dukkha so instead we'll have to use many words <laughs> life is wanting what you don't currently have life is achieving a goal that you've been ambitiously striving for but then once you've reached it you barely pause to celebrate your eyes moving on to the next prize you're just perpetually dissatisfied with the state of things always wanting for more boredom in and of itself is an example of dukkha it is not being able to just be with things you are frustration life is frustration life is just blah sometimes it just doesn't make sense and then yeah sometimes it is just downright suffering and misery but even when it's not extreme it's also not ever even close to approaching perfect and that's all we want that's all we want is that so much to ask for just a perfect life is that too much to ask for no but seriously buddha was preaching fuck the hedonic treadmill like long before fucking scientists even had thoughts <laughs> i'm kidding what even vipassana meditation is a practice in india that dates back 2500 years the goal in Vipassana meditation, although you could also say that it is a corruption or perversion of Vipassana to even claim that there is a goal, but regardless, the goal is to just be still. If your thoughts are racing, observe, do not chase them, do not race with them, just observe, don't engage. After all, these are not thoughts in your mind they are just thoughts in a mind your mind your thoughts maybe what does it even mean to be yours what does it even mean to be you is your mind something that you possess or 
are you your mind? You and your mind are the same thing, different words for the same concept. Is there a you? Is there a me? What are we even talking about when we say there is a self? Well, obviously myself is myself, me, like my childhood, my experiences, my hobbies, my talents, my interests, my disinterests, the people that I love, the people I don't love, my family. I am me, like it's self-evident. I'm here in front of you right now, like this is who I am. Duh, doesn't seem to require much of an explanation. I hope. Does it require more of an explanation? <laughs> What are you talking about? So let's say that the person who is me has the skill of being able to play the piano. Now that's a recently developed skill. The piano playing version of Kelly who exists today, is she different than the version of Kelly who existed before she could play the piano? Um, if he subtracted piano playing, is that like a big aspect of who I am and if you alter that then it's no longer me so I am now more me than I was then before well no obviously not like that's a silly thing you're just comparing two different versions of me at two different points in my life but they're both still me it's just I've changed I am fluid so we're saying that the self is fluid well yeah yeah, sure. Yeah, the self is fluid. Okay. Oh, okay. There is a person, me, who is called Kelly. I was named that at birth. And I have, she has a set of patterned behavior that she just kind of goes with a lot of the time, has certain identity markers that she picks up and puts them around her neck and then sometimes takes them off and then whatever. Um, yeah, she exists. Um, and these labels that she places around her at times, well, they are not rule or law. They are just conveniences. Just a convenient way to get other people to quickly have an idea of who you are. But again, who you are? Hmm? Where then is her essence of self? Where is she? Where's Waldo? Okay. Perhaps then, who you are, your essence of self, is not in the things about you that can change. It's not in your behavior or your identity markers. These things are too flimsy. They don't really work. A person's behavior can change, their identity can change, all these things. It's got to be the things about a person that are unchanging. Their species, their genetics. Their genetics. Well, that works if you assume that your genes, which is the, um, what is it, like the instructions for the DNA in your body that go around basically just instructing your cells on how to present themselves. Is that what it is? Hold on, let me just read this. Genes, which are the instructions uh, in DNA that carry out what goes on in the body, are also unchanging. So we assume that, right? Your genetics are just that is who you are. That is, you know, going to probably take responsibility for a lot of your behaviors, your inclination to being addicted to substances or not addicted to substances or to be an introvert or an extrovert. We take a lot of that stuff from our parents. Have a fast metabolism or a slow metabolism. Once again, scientists are finding that this isn't exactly the case either. What we thought was a one-way street, our genetics to affecting us and who we are, it's actually a two-way street. We can affect our genetics in this thing called epigenetics. Let's give you a case. So identical twins of so people with identical genetic material can actually be found to have divergent genetic makeup as they grow older when their lives aren't lived in identical ways. Sleep, diet, exercise, and other environmental conditions can change the makeup of our genetics. There's nothing about you that is completely unchanging. It's because nothing is entirely permanent. So, Back to this idea of Vipassana meditation. If you've succeeded at Vipassana, then you'll find that there was never really such a thing as success. 
And if you fail at Vipassana, it never really mattered in the first place. In the end, this is about breaking down the associations that we hold between things. Breaking down the association between your thoughts and who you are. Watching the traffic go by from the sidewalk. It's about not claiming ownership over anything. You're not even claiming ownership over your mind. Fucking trippy, man. If you feel bored while practicing this meditation, note what it physically feels like to feel that boredom. If you're finding yourself thinking about all the things that you should be doing right now, inspect that. What does it mean to think something should be done? What is this should? What would it mean if you thought about could or would? <laughs> Be non-judgmental about what thoughts you find. Feel the weight of your physical body, the expansion and contraction of your breathing chest, the warm pump of blood from limb to limb, the relative chill or warmth of the air around your body. This existence in this time and place for all that it's worth is all that there is. Is this calming, existentially daunting, indifferent, sad, happy? Does it matter? You may wonder if there's a tipping point in meditation where after a person has put in X amount of hours, whether it be hundreds or thousands of hours, where they've found that they've successfully broken their association between all of these things, once you realize that this body that you inhabit, there is no you and nothing, no one really inhabits anything, well then what? Once you've eliminated all of your desires and cravings and wants and wishes and, and dislikes and likes, what are you left with? This idea that you kind of look within so many things, try to examine each one of their individual aggregates and find that ultimately there's this sort of lack of property to all things, lack of essence to all things. They call this emptiness. Once you've truly internalized this idea of emptiness, you may wonder, have we just found a really roundabout way to be utterly nihilistic about life? Remember drugs, this nihilism thing that we're talking about, you don't need 10,000 hours of Vipassana meditation to achieve what we're talking about here. Try two strong tabs of acid and then go be alone for six hours. And I'm not saying you will, but I'm also not saying that you won't break every strong association that you have between yourself and others and love and what it means to be a human person. Break every strong association between time and the sun, between thoughts and yourself between people and love. You don't wonder if you'll never be happy again because what's the point? Happiness is fake anyway. Time is an illusion. Life is empty. The universe is a pathetic joke played on you to make you think. What? What even? You make it up. Insert your own adventure doesn't fucking matter. Literally. Does not fucking matter. This is a really bad trip. Alternatively, have you ever done drugs and had a great fucking time? Like, seriously, don't take two tabs of acid and go be alone. Take two tabs of acid and then go be with your favorite people in the world. Revel in their company, hold their faces in your hands, kiss their foreheads. They're the best people. Talk to them about how much you love them and how that love is just the biggest 
best thing. Go on an outdoor adventure with them and run barefoot through the streets with just the rain kind of falling all over and squishing things between your bare toes, all disgusting and just, ah. Go look closely at a beetle on a tree and marvel at its beauty and then wave your friend over to come look at it with you and both of you just say wow in unison and with tears in your eyes this joy is real and it's transcendent and it's beautiful so there is another meditation that i'd like to talk about called meta meditation or translated to loving kindness meditation in the practice of meta meditation you first calm your mind as always and you imagine that you are with someone that you love very much imagine someone who is near and dear to your heart they could be someone who has passed away they could be someone who has not passed away it could be your spouse your mom your brother sibling child whoever just imagine that this is someone who is dear to your heart and imagine just pouring out your love and compassion and empathy to this person. Imagine just a well of just gratitude and warmth going their way. Now imagine another person who you also love dearly. They're very close to your heart and doing the same thing with them. Imagine more and more people that you love, people in your family, people that you work with, your friends, your longtime past schoolmates, so many people. Uh, extend it to all of them. This cherishing of who they are and this appreciation in who they are. Start to extend it to people who you're kind of indifferent towards. Now imagine it with people who are more difficult in your life. Pour the love out to them. Extend the love as far as your imagination can bring you until you're imagining people that you've never met before and you're loving them. After doing this, for however long it takes. It might take you 20 minutes to fully imagine exactly how that love feels in your body, in your heart. It might take 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour to like fully do this practice. And when you're done, you might feel this sense of kind of gentle euphoria, a radiant well-wishing upon them. Whether you do this practice only once or you do it many times throughout your week, month, life, you might find that your heart gets this sort of tenderness to it and you look upon all things, people, creatures, objects with this sort of uh, this gentleness upon the things that you see and the people that you see and in this compassion. Um, you see just a, a sort of lovely beauty in all people despite their flaws or the mistakes or imperfections. It's, it's very nice. Uh, so hopefully you can experience this. Um, but maybe you won't, maybe you won't, maybe you won't experience, maybe you'll try, but then afterwards you just, the lens of cynicism returns to your face, to your eyes and, and the way that you look at people is just not that affected. It does happen. Alexa, turn on the lantern. Alexa. Turn lantern purple. Red? And brown. Hmm. Lantern green. Yeah! Okay, 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 green it is. What we're getting at here though is that Buddhist philosophy certainly does not boil down to nihilism. You may be missing the point or maybe just not learning enough about the philosophy to think that it does just boil down to nihilism. It doesn't. It's a lot more beautiful than that and complex than that. There's this entire concept of people who are on the path towards Buddhahood um, called, forgive me if I don't pronounce this correctly, but Bodhisattva. 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 Everything that I know about Buddhism is just by reading lots of books and internet threads and all these things. The path of the Bodhisattva which is somebody who's on the path towards becoming a Buddha. Someone who even has this potential to become a Buddha is someone with a compassionate well-wishing towards other people. They have an enlightened mind, an enlightened heart, and they have the desire to bring as many people along with them as they can towards 
nirvana and enlightenment. Now, this idea of nirvana and enlightenment, it can be literally true or it can be allegorically true. It doesn't really matter. Um, you know, something can be true without being real. This idea that we've lived many lives and that we're going to be reborn and again and again until we can find this enlightenment, this nirvana, it's true not necessarily literally real, but it's true. If we take this for granted that we are all constantly being reborn into different bodies, that you have been literally every person who's ever been alive and ever will be alive. In another life, you were my mother. I was your mother. Finding perhaps there is no soul or mine is yours and yours is mine. Another exercise is to imagine this person, any person, any person at all, um, person that you've had difficulties with, a person that you just want to get to know better, whoever. Imagine them as your mother. Now imagine that your mother is blind, helpless, she's standing near the edge of a cliff, and you are standing next to her, not blind, aware of the situation, and you're able to help her. Wouldn't you help her? And if you wouldn't help her, then it's very likely that you are in fact a person who is blind, helpless, and standing near the edge of a cliff and are in need of help. Something that you'll often hear people who study Buddhist philosophy and try to teach it to others. Something that you'll hear them say is that you don't have to learn the lessons of Buddhism to become a better Buddhist. You can just use them to become a better whatever you already are. You don't have to have the ambition to become a Buddha. It doesn't really matter. These labels don't really mean much upon further inspection. There's associations between things and remember we're trying to break our association down between things. Your ambition to become enlightened might corrupt the act of actually becoming enlightened. What's important is that the more that you examine every aspect of your life, your relationships, the path that you are on in your life, the more that you'll start to notice these similarities between yourself and your life and other creatures and people and their lives. And you'll find this concept staring you in the face that we are all one and the same. It's the fact that so much of us having a perspective on things is weighted down by the fact that it's a perspective at all. Our observations on the world are filtered through our human senses, our sense of touch, sight, hearing, taste. Our senses evolved to help us survive and pass on our genetics, but we didn't really evolve to see the world through an objective lens. When you hear a rustling in the bush and you see something, you think maybe it's a snake and you jump and it was a chipmunk, but you saw a snake for a brief second. Your senses deceived you, your brain deceived you, but maybe 99 times out of 100, it was gonna be a chipmunk. But the one time that it was a snake and you jumped to get away from it, you lived, you were evolved to survive not see the world objectively. So this lens, this subjective survival technique lens that we view the world through is inherently skewed. I mean, what is a lens anyway? A lens is something, it is a medium through which light bends and refracts it, bends light. That is what a lens is. And if the only way that you or me or anyone can ever see things in focus is by putting a lens in front of our eyes and bending light to such a degree that it comes in focus one way or the other, you know, we're kind of stuck in this perpetual loop of objective reality is never really gonna be our reality. There's not much that you can do about it other than just understand that fact and move on with it always kind of somewhere in the back of your mind knowing well the way that I see things is not it's not gonna be the way things inherently are and oh baby oh look at these cats I'm surrounded crazy fucking cat lady okay so like they mention in the book, the phrase new hedonism, um, that's what Lord Henry Wotton dubs his philosophy. And this new hedonism, this pleasure seeking behavior, Dorian lives by these principles 
for 20 years, basically. Yeah, he just lives for his sensual pleasures and but also not just sensual pleasures. I mean, again, his whole romance with Sybil Vane was based on the fact that she was the best at her craft, at what she did. She was an artist. He loved her for that. I mean, that's something that John Stuart Mills would deem high quality pleasure. Dorian also really loves listening to the philosophy and intellectualizing that his good friend Lord Henry partakes in. A fucking man after John Stuart Mills' own heart. You see, there's some problems with Dorian Gray. A hedonist like Jeremy Bentham might even argue, I don't know if he did argue this, but I think that he would argue this. <laughs> I mean, Jeremy Bentham, if you look at this guy, Jeremy was like, Again, he lived from the years like 1732 to whatever fucking year he died. 1748 to 1832, 32, I don't remember. He was an advocate for like just it being okay to be a homosexual or to have homosexual behaviors. Also believed in women's rights and was a bit of like an advocate for feminism. His philosophy and ideas around putting these ideas of pleasure and pain into quantifiable things they led him to like come to some pretty progressive conclusions some like he was before his time in a lot of ways so i think that somebody like jeremy bentham would argue that hedonism when done properly should be pro-social and not anti-social like if you're going to live on a philosophical rule of thumb that you want to maximize pleasure for yourself and others. Like the and others aspect is important. But if you're a drunk and you act like an asshole towards people, and you say, whatever, I'm drunk, I'm happy, I'm driving pleasure from it, but you're being a fucking dick to everybody and it's causing them pain, then it doesn't add up. It's not ethical hedonism. It's not, you're not doing it right, man. And Dorian Gray, it's in the text Dorian Gray causes a lot of fucking pain. He murders a guy. He blackmails somebody else. Dorian lives a life that causes pain to other people and pleasure to himself. And yet he calls it this new hedonism. And you listen to Lord Henry Wotton talk about the thought systems that are the reason that Dorian is living the way that he's living. Lord Henry is just like supremely aware that he doesn't even believe what he's saying. I think it's Basil who says something to Lord Henry that's along the lines of, oh, Lord Henry, you never say a right thing and you never do a wrong thing. It's like kind of you watch Lord Henry and his actions and he's kind of loved by the people in his community. People think he's charming and charismatic and lovely. Lord Henry is a pretty pro-social guy. He just says some funny, provocative, controversial things at dinner. But does he live by them? Eh, like to some extent, but not the way that Dorian lives by it. Dorian takes it to a goddamn extreme and it's shown that at first, Dorian is utterly fascinated by watching the picture show the lines of corruption on the oil painting. It's like a study for him. It is the most interesting thing. Watching the degradation of his soul happen in real time on canvas. What does this have to do with finding lasting happiness? I almost read Dorian Gray, and I don't think that this is intended by Oscar Wilde at all. The more I read about Oscar Wilde and his personal beliefs, Oscar Wilde was kind of a believer in a lot of things that Lord Henry Wotton was a believer in, just I think to a lesser degree and didn't like. But he did cheat on his wife uh, with a man after he already had children, he cheated on his wife. Uh, that was arguably an anti-social thing to do. So, you know, I don't think that Oscar Wilde would agree with what I'm about to say about Dorian Gray, but I do think that picture of Dorian Gray is kind of a parable, a warning of sorts of what not to fucking do. And what not to fucking do is be anti-social and cause pain and suffering to those around you. Don't do that. 
because it will degrade your soul and you will go mad. Look at her. You got a little kitty. She's so cute. Just give her a little foot, a little squish, a little squish. Baby. Oh, I squashed her. Kelly. <laughs> You're all fucking over the place with this, okay? Like, first you started talking about just uh, what it means to be a goal-setting person. And, oh, the camera's shaking way too much. And then hedonism, and then the hedonic treadmill, and Oscar Wilde, and murder orgies, and now this zen mind bullshit. What the fuck is your point? Where are you going with this? Well, who the fuck even are you to be qualified to be talking about any of this shit? To that, I say, good eye, you're right. I am not qualified to be talking about any of this. To be honest, we probably are tackling a subject that was hubristic of me to even think of that I could get it all in one video. No matter how clever I thought that I could be, I wasn't gonna be able to do this. Not really. I've given it a really good fucking try though. At least the best that I've got. Um. <laughs> On my journey, I am finding contradiction after contradiction, paradox after paradox, definitional inconsistencies. I guess what I really wanted was to speak to the truth that we need to liberate ourselves from the systems that we find we are trapped in, the systems we place ourselves in, and the systems that others place us into. Um, but that is way fucking easier said than done. It's ridiculous for me to think that I can preach that type of thing. I can't even give you a fucking plan. I can't give myself a plan on how to escape the mess that we are in. Happiness, I mean, that's what I wanted it to be about, but happiness is almost a kind of side effect to what I'm really talking about here. What I'm really talking about here is liberation and optimism. Liberation insofar as our consciousness, and that is where this mindfulness meditation and Buddhism and meta-meditation in terms of loving kindness towards any being, all creatures, wanting to have compassion towards all sentient beings and set our minds free. Yeah, sure, absolutely. That's a big fucking deal and that would be lovely if we could achieve that. I think on a societal level, there are some things we need to address before we can get, we can't talk about a pursuit of happiness that doesn't include an abolishment of homelessness. Like, I'm sorry, but that's just, that's just not going to happen. So there's this principle of understanding that we all do better when we all do better. And that is where our hearts need to find their focus. I won't find happiness until you're happy. You won't find happiness until your brother is happy. Happiness being such a vague term, again, definitional inconsistencies. What is happiness? Well, you know it when you feel it. And optimism is a requirement. This loving kindness meditation contributes to optimism in each other's souls, in our deservingness for redemption. We can save ourselves. We can do it. We are endowed with the skill that it takes. We just need to fucking link arms and goddamn do it. And the liberation, yes, Liberation from our harmful thought patterns. Liberation from being totally controlled by our reactive emotions. But also liberation from capitalism. From not having time to ourselves, to our people, our chosen loved ones. I mean, yes, we want to love all people all of us. <laughs> Honestly, I think that a, another big reason why sometimes we do face these barriers in loving each other is that we have these systems that are set up transactionally to completely degrade 
human connection. I cannot tell you how ironically frustrating it is to be told by your corporate manager that uh, you need to foster a genuine connection with the customer when the relationship of customer to retail worker is the most antithetical situation for what a genuine connection is. It's a joke. A joke. Oh, I could fucking, oh, but I don't want to go on that tangent right now. And the fact that we feel so compelled to compare ourselves to each other, that's, I mean, I get why we do it, because we should all have an equitable standard of living, one that has us thriving in joy, love, and prosperity, and, and sensible distribution of resources. <laughs> and yes, this is all about happiness, and this is about the people of Blackpool, and Blackpool here, it's, it's a stand-in for all of these economically desperate people and places. Uh, this was, this was too big of a topic for me to tackle. Ah. But yes, yes. What do we want? Optimism and liberation. When do we want it? Fucking yesterday. Hold on though. Wait, no. I thought this was a video about finding lasting happiness. Now all of a sudden it's about liberation and optimism. What the fuck? You keep on changing gears because you can't keep your eye on one focused thing and you just keep on thinking that you can switch it without anybody noticing about what you're actually doing in this video. Well, okay. I want to argue that you're splitting hairs here by saying that there's some big difference between finding lasting happiness and optimism and liberation. I don't know that there's that big of a difference between those things, but okay, you know what? I'll take you at your word. Let's say that there is a big difference between lasting happiness and liberation and optimism. She poked my little nose with her little paw. Okay, she wants to escape now. All right, Ooh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, oh, well, Here's where we're at. I started this video out with wanting to find some like wider range photographic answer for what it means to find lasting happiness in this world. And in that pursuit, I found that the premise was flawed, that our definitions are confusing, things don't always line up, and that the things that make us happy are oftentimes just fucking confusing. You can look back on the most miserable, difficult day of your life, like it is a funny story and you tell people about it and you laugh about it and it's like genuinely, you're just like this, <laughs> I can't believe this shit fucking happened, but it did. And you're happy to look back on it as in like, well, damn, I am fucking happy I made it through it. I'm good, I'm done with that now, and things are better. You're happy uh, to remember the most miserable day of your life. Vice versa, the happiest day of your life. You might look back on it with melancholy and nostalgia, sad that it's over and that you feel like some of the best days of your life are behind you now. Or maybe you're in the middle of running a fucking marathon and your feet feel like they're shattering beneath you with every fucking step forward that you take and you're fucking exhausted, but you get done with it. And at dinner that same night, you think of this marathon and you're celebrating and you're talking about it with your friends. Like this is the most reason to be proud day of your life. And you can also have a fucking orgasm and then feel ashamed of how good it felt. It's difficult to say what the hell it is that makes us fucking happy because we are fucking difficult people. So that's it. That's your like cop out for not doing what you set out to do. I mean, well, I wouldn't call it a cop out so much as a revelation. Mm hmm. But. Yeah, sure, call it a cop out if that's how you feel about it. Some people grow and realize that their old understanding of the world is not quite true and other people watch them grow and call them fucking hypocrites. So, doesn't matter. Uh, we're all each other's mothers and different lives. Earth shattering, but okay, all right. But I will leave you with this one last thing. 
our old friends, Mark Buchamp and Benjamin Sylvester, they had more in that paper on the hedonic, oh God, I can't put my feet on this chair, otherwise I rock up the fucking camera. They had more in that paper on the hedonic treadmill. They had this hedonic adaptation prevention model. What this was, was the hypothesis goes that introducing variety, variety, into a person's life will have a positive effect on their assessment of their own well-being. Let's unpack that. They had two test groups of students at whatever fucking university, I think we're back to the British Columbia one. They had two test groups of students and they gave both groups tasks to do. They wanted them both to perform acts of kindness for people. Ta-da! An act of kindness being defined as something that goes above and beyond what's normal and expected and requires some level of effort, time, or money. The first test group, they asked to just do the same act of kindness every fucking week for the duration of the test. And then the other group, they asked them to come up with a different act of kindness every week. No repeats, something different every time. At the end of the study, uh, the test group that was asked to do the random acts of kindness that were all different every week with no repeats had a substantial level of greater happiness than the group that had to do the same fucking act of kindness every week. They wanted to combine a previously understood aspect of what brings happiness, which is doing nice things for other people or, you know, having a giving heart. So they wanted to take that and then see if variety would spice this up as well. And it does! We like variety! It makes us fucking happy! Where are we left? Compare this again with those who take the path of the Bodhisattva and their mission, for lack of a better word, is to bring enlightenment to as many sentient beings as they can, to reduce suffering, to put out this loving, compassionate warmth out towards as many people as you can, and that being a necessity for achieving enlightenment and prosperity for all human beings. I don't know. Nirvana, come as you are. Give away your money. Do acts of kindness. Be kind to strangers. Love. Love, 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 love. Love is all you need. So switch it up a lot, okay? Do crazy things, variety of things. Take off your shoes. You don't even need shoes, okay? Unless you live in this mess um, in fucking February. I started this video in January. It's February now. Big picture. Here's what we got. Practice Vipassana meditation, aka mindfulness meditation. Remember, all art is quite useless, but also don't take Oscar Wilde for granted on everything that he said. It's not very helpful for those of us who want to make a fucking difference in this world. Be ever loving and compassionate towards all people, including strangers and people that you dislike. You know, remember that all you've ever had is this moment. And remember that as much as health contributes to your lasting happiness and promotes your own well-being, remember that equally too, promoting the well-being and health of other people is just as important. As much as it's good to have a strong routine of exercise and sleep and uh, going to the gym and all these things, remember to switch it up. Maybe tonight only get like five hours of sleep because tonight you're going to the fucking bar, okay? You're gonna go to the bar and you're gonna socialize with some people that you've never fucking met before and you're gonna talk to them about enlightenment and see what they think. And tomorrow, fucking forget tomorrow. Tomorrow does not fucking exist. Live fast, die young, and remember to kiss your mother. Oh, why did I just say it like that? Okay. Live fast, die young, and remember to kiss your mother. <laughs> Live fast, die young, and remember to kiss your mother. <laughs> why do I want to say it like that? Live fast, Die young and remember to kiss your mom. Live fast, die young, remember to kiss your mom. Live fast, die young, remember to kiss your mom. Live fast, die young, remember to kiss your mom. I'm so fucking tempted to just leave this video there because I am so tired. Can you tell? Can you tell I'm tired of this video? I'm like, I. I just wanted to make a video like, huh, happiness. I feel like sometimes happiness is a little bit elusive and sometimes I have a hard time 
attaining it or keeping it after I've attained it. So I just want to examine this a little bit closer. And so I did. And so I wanted to go really hard on my research, but now I am finding like this shit runs deep and it is not going to be the same for all of us. And your circumstances are going to have a really big impact. Obviously, like these are obvious things. I don't know why I didn't like, like I thought about it, but I was like, I'll be able to address it. I'll be able to address it. An hour long video, no big deal. I'll be able to address it. I can't. I can't address it all. I've barely touched on like mental illness. I've barely touched on it. And then I have barely touched on the circumstances of poverty. I mean, I barely came to a conclusion on the people of Blackpool. As a matter of fact, I don't think I did come to a conclusion on the people of Blackpool and the other people who are living in a state of just desperation financial strain and desperation in these trying times and there's a fucking pandemic and turmoil and climate change i mean jesus christ do we have a fucking chance do we have a fucking chance at happiness in this world <sighs> so honestly consider this part one to like probably a hundred parts <laughs> Ultimately, I think every video that I ever make is going to be about finding lasting happiness, optimism, and liberation. And ultimately, we're going to have to come to the big conclusion. You know what I'm talking about. Viva la revolution. Orb. <laughs> I'm gonna fall off the table. This video. Oh shit. Oh shit. We have like these branches of hedonism that all stem off from the same core. And can you stop? Go hedonism. I'm always looking at myself. I'm never looking at you, the camera. Hi, you're the one I'm actually talking to, despite the fact that I spend the majority of the time not looking at you. Um, <laughs> it's because I <laughs> am also obsessed with my youth as Dorian Gray was, although I think I'm older than Dorian Gray was, so. Mm. All right, listen, <laughs> much of a difference. So, um, were you able to film again? Knock, knock, hello. I'm just busting your balls. Those uh, parameters were certainty, prop and fuck. I can't say this word. I didn't even know that this was a word until I read this, but and the second word's even worse, but prop and prop and prop and quitty, prop and quit, prop and quitty. So certainty, propinquity, feast Sunday. I gotta look this one up. I don't even know how to say this one. Feesundity. Oh my god. Can she say it for me, please? Comrade ethical hedonism through? Like the utilitarian cone it is. How to pronounce Fee sundity. Fee sundity? Fee sundity. Got certainty. Propinquity. <laughs> Propinquity. Fecundity. Fuck. What the fuck am I even saying? Short, thick set man facing him. What do you want? <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? What do you want? He gasped. <laughs> what do you want? What do you want? This video is brought to you. Hey. This video is brought to you by